The Lord be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to give you grace and peace. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church.
My Christian friends, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, once again we come before you seeking the inspiration, the illumination that comes by the power of your Holy Spirit. May your Spirit interpret your word for us, that your written word will become your incarnate word living within us, abiding in us, taking root and engrafting itself to our souls, that we may have within us the same heart and mind that was in Christ Jesus. Speak to us your word, that we may be so transformed in the renewing of our minds, that we may go forth into the world as new creations, so that all might know the kingdom of God through us, by our love and by our faith. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Our scripture lection for this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. In this passage, Jesus and the disciples are still on their way to Jerusalem, and it seems the closer and closer Jesus gets to Jerusalem, the harder his statements become. In this situation, he'll witness his own popularity as people are following him. And instead of, of feeling the success of his ministry by such popularity, he ends up telling the people who are following him that the cost of discipleship is probably more than they're thinking, that they need to step back and consider the cost of following him, the cost of taking up the cross, the cost of being a disciple. They need to consider it because Jesus is not upset if people don't follow him. He just wants them to know that if they do, it's costly. This is a message from Jesus himself, my Christian friends, that you and I probably don't want to hear. I may be preaching a sermon today from this passage that you and I don't want to hear. That said, my Christian friends, listen for the word of God. Now large crowds were traveling with him. And he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid, the founda laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore... None of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. What tough words, my Christian friends. What a hard lesson from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A tough message indeed, calling us to consider the cost. And I will tell you at the very start, as Jesus is calling to his disciples to follow, he is not disappointed, he is not ashamed of anyone who cannot do it. He just wants them to consider the cost before they step up and follow. Because following Christ, being a disciple, is costly. 
Have you ever made a commitment, I bet you have, have you ever made a commitment to an organization or to a committee without first finding out all that would be expected of you, my Christian friends? I'm going to say to you in the life of the church, I'll bet that happens to you often. If you've served on the session, if you've served on the board of deacons, you probably say to yourself once you're in it, I didn't think it was going to be this way. I didn't realize that there might be a little bit more involved than just having my name voted on in the congregation. Now, there's, there's more of a commitment. And, and you know that we've done this in our lives. We may have joined clubs or gotten involved in organizations without realizing the cost, what it, what it requires of us when we get into it. I mean, uh, have you ever uh, gotten caught up in, in joining a book club? Uh, now, I don't know if book clubs are very popular these days, but they certainly were when I was a young man. Uh, joining a book club sounded like a great idea when I was a young person because I was a voracious reader. I would love to have some new books. But then I discovered how difficult it was to get out of the book club because you didn't read the fine print to find out what is involved. Those books just keep coming and coming and coming, and they expect you to pay for them. Jesus warns those would-be followers about the cost of discipleship. It, it, it bothers me all too often, many times all too often, some pulpits, some preachers, some TV religious programs present the gospel as though it were, as though they were selling a used car, as though it's just as easy as anything that you're going to make out perfectly if you, uh, if you get involved in this deal, this thing called the church, this thing, this gospel of following Jesus Christ. You're going to make out just fine, and you don't want to miss out, like missing out on the best sale of a car. You don't want to miss this deal, because then you're a loser. No, my Christian friends, these persons, these, these, uh, these pulpits, these preachers, these religious TV programs, they make it sound, they make the church sound like it's, it's easy as, um, as, as anything. As though no real commitment is required. All you have to do is just, just confess in your heart that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, is Lord and Savior. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and your life will be fine. Christianity will reign through you. Jesus will live through you. You'll be imbued with the power of the Holy Spirit and your life will be honky-dory. It gets sold like that. That you will be on the road to everlasting salvation. That you're, uh, you're home free, free sailing at that point. All you have, uh, hardly any commitment at all. Just, just say it. All I need is your credit card number. You know, just sign on the dotted line. Easy. I will tell you, my Christian friends, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus' call to follow him was far different. He was not looking for superficial commitment. He wasn't looking for a crowd of, of tag-alongs. Instead, he required his followers to be totally committed if they were to follow him at all. He's okay if they don't follow. It's okay. Because he knows what the cost is. The cost is taking up the cross. The, the cost is a complete change of one's values and priorities. He knows this. And that commitment is hard. Jesus understands if we say no. But if we want to say yes, he just wants us to consider the cost of discipleship. My Christian friends, the language of cross-bearing that he uses here has been corrupted by overuse. Jesus tells us that if we're going to follow him, we are to carry the cross, take up the cross, that we have a cross to bear. Today, we often use that kind of language when we talk about, oh, chronic illness or, or physical pains or particularly trying situations with family and relations. Relationships aren't easy. Well, we'll say, I'll, we'll say, well, I guess that's just my cross to bear. That's just my cross to bear. These situations are not what Jesus is talking about when he calls us to bear the cross. 
to take up the cross for him. These situations of daily living, of the various problems we have, we all have them. These various problems in life are situations that we don't face deliberately. When we say that, that uh, this particular ailment, I, I'm dyslexic. I have a reading disability. I have since I was uh, just a, a young kid. I was taken out of school uh, in the fourth grade for an entire year for special education because of that learning disability. And I still have it. I don't, I don't feel embarrassed much by it anymore because I admit I have a reading problem. I love reading. I read voraciously, but I read slowly. I have a reading problem. I'm dyslexic. I could easily say, that's my cross to bear. But that's not what Jesus is talking about when he talks about bearing the cross. The cross which Jesus would have us bear is what we would do voluntarily, not something that is imposed upon us by conditions that we, <coughs> excuse me, by conditions that we can't help. No, the cross that we bear are those that we take on ourselves, not those that are put upon us by physical ailment or other situations in life that are beyond our control. The true cross-bearing is what we voluntarily do as, as a consequence of our commitment to Jesus Christ. When we commit to Jesus Christ voluntarily, we have a cross to bear, my Christian friends. Cross-bearing requires deliberate sacrifice. Cross-bearing requires exposure to risk and ridicule in order to follow Jesus. In a sense, my Christian friends, no one can know at the very start whether he or she will be able to fulfill the commitment of discipleship. Do we really know at the start? I submit to you, no. We don't really know at the start whether we could follow Jesus Christ. We don't really know the full cost Situations change in life. Jesus is not telling us that we won't stumble. He's not asking us to figure it out from the very start. Jesus was not asking for a guarantee of complete fidelity in advance. If he had been asking for that, no one would qualify to be a disciple because none of us could afford it. The cost would be too great. Through these parables that he offers to us this day, Jesus was simply calling for each and every one of us who would be followers to consider in advance what that commitment means, what that commitment requires. It's costly to follow Jesus Christ. Cultural accommodations of the Christian faith have progressively steadily increased over the past few years. I've noticed people have woven Christianity and modern American culture together in ways that it's not intended. As a result, many see no tension between the teachings of Jesus Christ and, and the common aspirations of middle-class America. In fact, we associate the two sometimes, that being a Christian means being a middle-class American, and vice versa. Sadly, that is not true. To do so is to water down both Christianity and what it means to be an American. We don't conflate those identities. To follow Jesus Christ is not to do so in embracing, thinking that we don't have to make sacrifices to our middle-class American values. They're not the same. On the contrary, a complete change of priorities, a complete change of values, and pursuits is required. Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote in, in 2 Corinthians that in Christ we become not just nice people, we become a new creation. It's not just that we suddenly decide, okay, I'm just going to have a nicer attitude about things. No. We are committing to, a, to be a brand new creation, to be remade to be turned over. In Christ, we're not just good people. We're a brand new creation, the Apostle Paul says. 
when Jesus turned and saw the crowd following him, he was not impressed by his own popularity. He wasn't impressed by his success. He was not interested in a casual, easy acceptance which the crowd offered. That's not what he was interested in. His eyes are set on Jerusalem. His eyes are set on the cross. His eyes are set on the cost of saving the world. His eyes are set on the cost of making the kingdom of God a reality in this sinful and broken world. His eyes are set on a Jerusalem which calls us to take up the cross, the cost of discipleship. You know, that in the passage here, it does say those, those interesting statements, how much we have to hate our, our family, our friends, our relationships, even life itself. How we have to give up our possessions. What he's saying, to give, uh, and these are tough statements that have to be taken darn seriously, my Christian friends. Giving up our possessions means to be ready to sacrifice all attachments to this world in order to follow the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. The cost of discipleship is paid in many different kinds of currency for each and every one of us. For, <coughs> for some of us, it's a redirection of time and energy that is required of us. For some, a change in personal relationships is required. For others, a change in our very vocations, our jobs, is required. Still others, a change in a commitment to our financial resources is required. No matter what it may cost some of us, every one of us called to discipleship, the commitment is all-consuming. There are no part-time disciples, my Christian friends. A complete change in priorities is required. I don't want to hear this. You don't want to hear this. Discipleship is costly. That's what Jesus is saying. At least he's being honest, my Christian friends. Jesus isn't running a book club. Jesus is not asking for your credit card number where you can purchase the convenience of Christianity and have cheap grace for getting into heaven. He does ask us to follow. He's not ashamed to ask. He just wants to make sure that you know that what he's asking for is no light matter. It's been said to me on some occasions that uh, we should be cautious in asking for people to volunteer to do various things in the life of the church. And admittedly, that's true. But I am also in the line with Jesus that I think it's okay for people to say no if they want to, without any judgment or preconceptions. Only they know whether they can afford the cost of volunteering to do this or that program. Sometimes, however, people assume that, that the, the church needs to operate by, uh, from the top down with the pastor, the DCE, the music director, the office manager. I can tell you, honestly, my Christian friends, we give, but we burn out too. No, the church is not successful from the top down. It's successful from the roots up. It's organic. That's why Jesus uses agrarian parables to talk about the kingdom of God. You're the church. And yes, I'll stand here from the pulpit and I'll ask for people to volunteer for various ministries and missions, various programs in the life of the church. I am not ashamed to ask. You shouldn't be ashamed to say no. All I'm asking when I ask you to volunteer for something, my Christian friends, is just consider the cost. The church, is, the church can be successful, not because of the top-down powers, but because of each and every person who makes up the kingdom of God, you and me. Yes, it is costly. Weigh it and figure out how much of yourself you can give to following Jesus Christ, knowing there's no judgment and how much or how little you can commit. Because it is costly. I know this. It can cost our family. It can cost us relationships. It can cost us our jobs. It can cost us time and energy. 
It can cost us our very being to become transformed into being a new creation. As I said from the very start, this is a tough message from Jesus Christ, what he says to these disciples. All he's saying is this, my Christian friends, there's no such thing as part-time discipleship. There are no partial commitments that can be accepted if we follow Jesus Christ. Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name. as with one voice reaffirm our Christian faith using the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ God's only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and was buried he descended to the dead on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My Christian friends, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, we are aware that the cost of discipleship is great. Many times, all too often, it is sold to us, perhaps as a bill of goods, sold to us as easy religion, as cheap grace, as nothing more than the assurance that we are on the road to heaven and that nothing more is required. 
we pray that you will lift us up from our complacency and that you will remind us that we falter and fail all too often when we follow Christ. Remind us in the words that we have heard from your son this day that we are called to consider the cost. We know that if we cannot guarantee success in our following, but we are called to follow and we are called to commit fully, completely, giving our very selves to Christ. We pray that by your spirit, you will ease the burden of our complacency. Help us to be strong. Help us when we grow weak to accept our frailties, to pick ourselves up by your good grace and to live on. Help us to be faithful disciples, even as we are not always certain of the cost. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. He who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
charge you, my Christian friends, to go in peace with this free people, serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always.